Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the session with Simon and are really excited about some of the new features and updates to the platform. Again, I know we all are. This group in particular, because we are going to kick off our Ask Me Anything session now. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <Ooh, laughs> <yeah. laughs> I love the enthusiasm. And I am joined by a very, very special group of folks. This is the Brain Trust. They are not the A team, they are the A on A team. <laughs> Get it? And a plan on and a plan. That's right. Um, from your right to left, we have Byron, Stephanie, Thibault, and of course a familiar face, Aaron, because we've already done the Connected Planning Playbook session. And I'm just going to ask them to do a quick intro so you can get to know them, as I have been getting to know them. <laughs> Byron, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'm Byron McCovich from the Anaplan and Anaplan team. I've been here at the company for about a year and a half. Before that, I was at an aerospace company doing fp and use cases. Since I've been here, I've been building out PBF along with Stephanie and SPM along with Thibault. I'm Stephanie Bowie. I'm a corporate finance manager. I joined Anaplan about two years ago. and. At that time, I had no Anaplan skills, but as Byron said, we um, worked together to build our financial model, and now I can't stop building. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Thibaut, uh, Thibaut Rokul. I just moved to San Francisco a couple of days ago. Uh, I joined uh, Anaplan five years ago, and I'm part of the sales operation team. Great. I'm Erin Groutman. I'm a business operations manager on the Anaplan on Anaplan team. I've been with Anaplan for just three mm -hmm. months now. Uh, it's not a ton of experience, but loving to learn the platform. Prior to joining Anaplan, I spent um, two years at Tesla and five years at Apple doing fp &A. So as you can see, a really well-qualified group to answer a ton of your questions. But I'm going to start with my own question for them. Anaplan on Anaplanners here at Anaplan are a unique group. We're all users for sure, but you guys are the super brain trust behind how we use the, the platform. So if I were to ask you, what is your spirit animal? <laughs> what would you say? Ooh, oh, gosh. I'm going to put them right on the spot, <laughs> spot from the start. <laughs> Come on, guys. We're Specific both. to Anaplan or like our experience with the Anaplan or in general? In general, that makes okay. you be that Anaplan on Anaplan A on A team member. Um, well, I, I was going to say like a puppy because I'm so new to Anaplan and I'm like really excited about learning it. Um, so I'm going to go with that. Puppy. It's <laughs> a good one. I like that. Uh, I was going to say an owl because we fly above everything so we get a lot of visibility. Right. Not sure about the nocturnal part. I do mostly work during the day. Um, <laughs> I can't turn my neck all the way around. Um, but we see a lot and uh, we like to have high visibility and we're very knowledgeable about the platform. So I'll say. Yeah. Good one. Um, I would be, my spirit animal would be a, an elephant, and that's because <laughs> I think elephants, they say, never forget, and I always tell my friends that. <laughs> that's a good one. Good trait. <laughs> yeah, I was not ready for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Welcome to San Francisco. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have honestly no idea. <laughs> we'll come back to you at the end of it then. Yeah. Because we do have some fantastic questions that have come in. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one, direct from the poll EB, so please make sure you go to the forum thread, submit your questions for the A on A panel, vote on them, rank them, I've got a live stream right here. So the first question, guys, is we are in dire need of a multi-select type feature so that users are able to do analysis and see roll-ups of items that don't naturally roll up that way in the hierarchy. It's a huge pain point for our users now, and we don't have the ability to change the hierarchy to solve this. Any thoughts, ideas on the workaround, or how do you guys tackle this challenge? And maybe I'll throw this one to you first, Byron. Yeah, so um, I'd just like to start by saying that we get a lot of product enhancement um, requests that come down the pipe from our customers, also internally. And so usually how we handle stuff like that is just by communicating back to product engineering, uh, which I covered today in the uh, customer zero concept. And so uh, the best way to handle that is to communicate with your CS team and come up with a way to um, get those product features um, you know, in front of our product team so that they can make the enhancements. As far as workarounds go, probably can't come up with one off the top of my head, um, but we do all sorts of hierarchy changes and like nested hierarchies <coughs> within Anaplan in order to uh, solve business needs. So it just depends on kind of the use case. But for the most part, I'd say talk to CS and talk to product and then we can get some uh, changes coming. Fantastic advice, and always use the community forum to reach out to an expert um, and get that hands-on support. We can always connect you with Byron if needed. Um, 
we do have another question that came in, and this one's a little bit more finance related, so we'll throw it over to you, Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> How do you use a sum formula in conjunction with the native user list line item associated with users? When we try and do this, we get an error stating no top level is defined. Um, I don't that's a very like, technical question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a live help desk. Although right? it sounds like yeah. a familiar problem. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the not having a top level hierarchy just means that in the list you haven't set a parent uh, within the list itself. And so if you go back into your general list section, you can find and see if there's a parent within that list. Um, from there, I would just search community, like Hannah suggested, see if there's any other uh, possible solutions that can that can help you out there. Um, those error messages are really indicative of your problem. So definitely, whenever you like um, have an error out in a formula, check out those error messages and, and read into them, um, and then maybe just post that on community, and they'll help you out. That's why the community exists. We've mm -hmm. got seventeen thousand five hundred members to help each wow. other. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Thibaut, new to San Francisco, <laughs> inner sales ops. Someone wrote in, I've heard you have an SPM model that includes many SPM use cases. How and when do you decide to split many use cases out of a single model into multiple separate model versus keeping them all in one? Um, yeah, I guess the uh, products give you the flexibility to um, bring everything in a single model, but it really depends on what is the end purpose of each model. So for instance, we have a self forecasting model which is dedicated to self forecasting and we have a territory and quota model which is dedicated to territory and quota. We could combine both, but it's for different users and there is no necessary no, no need to do it. And what you can do with an appliance is always connect one model to the other, so load the data from one to the other. So as part of our um, cadence, load cadence, mm -hmm. we uh, we can load Mod, um, data from a model to an, on another, so no need to uh, have everything in a single model. Got it. So what it sounds like is know who's going to be looking for the data and the information exactly. and the insights and you build the use case and model to that. Exactly. You need to have a clear governance of what each model needs to do. That is good advice. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron, one for you here. Okay. <laughs> How do you keep data in sync across all your spoke models? Got it. So I think and these guys can correct me if I misspeak, um, but as, as we were talking about earlier in this presentation today, we have a data hub, obviously that's our hub. Um, so the question is how do we keep our data kind of consistent along our spoke models? So we actually have um, automatic imports that we can run from our spoke models to our import, excuse me, from our hub model to our spoke models. Um, so we can make sure that they're refreshing on specific cadences that way, so people aren't just refreshing as they need. Um, and that's something that we found works really well for us. And we're using HyperConnect for that. Yeah. And then there's other models that we have that we purposely do not want to have automated connections, right. like PDF is an example of that, where we only want to update the headcount for the current close, and so we do a one-time update that Stephanie mm -hmm. manages. So it kind of depends on yeah. what you'd like. Right? Yeah. And I would say communication. If you are telling everyone, like, hey, we're going to make this update, everyone is everyone is on sync, not just your models. So everyone knows what is up being updated. That's true. And you know, that's something that comes up quite a bit when you think about using Anna Plan within your organization is the cultural shifts that have to go along mm -hmm. with that. Absolutely. And perhaps I'll ask each of your your thoughts and opinions on what is the one thing from a cultural perspective that is absolutely critical to Aona or Anna Plan platform use success. The wall start because I have a, a good answer is collaboration. So Anaplan models in general, the data collaborates with itself. Anaplan is great at talking to itself. So you have that native connection within the platform to communicate. On top of that, you have to have the personal collaboration between the teams. So we solve that here by having an Anaplan council that everyone here is a part of, where we're constantly communicating and getting information together and um, <laughs> trying to update information uh, and talk to each other with. And so having collaboration within data and people really makes uh, a great marriage between the two. And I would add to that just having a yes attitude. You know, there's always questions like, can you add this on Anaplan? And it just, as Byron said, it takes collaboration, but it takes for you to say yes and just seeing like, okay, what can we do? How can we do this better? Um, so that's my input on that. Uh, for me, it would be like Byron's, like collaboration is, is really the key. Um, we need to communicate within the team uh, to make sure we uh, all agree on the, on the process. and. Uh, Make sure everything works, uh, works well. You need also to have a 
it's always about governance, but have a clear definition of um, what are the key APIs, how do you define it to make sure everybody uses the same, so you don't have any dis dis um, differences between the data. Of course, yeah. I think another good one is just making sure that when you're building models in Anaplan that you're investing the time up front and you're not just throwing things together because you'll find that you could waste a ton of time later trying to band-aid different issues. Um, so I think it's really important to just make sure that you invest the time, you do it right, um, and you'll get a lot more bang for your buck that way. Yeah, that is a, a really good point. We held an event here with um, two customers, Box and Adroll, and both of them said the same thing. It's not about taking what you did previously and just in making the same thing in Anaplan, but rather thinking how do you improve the process, improve the governance, and get to that outcome faster. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry guys, I've been distracted from your list of questions here that I've been flying in. All right, <laughs> here's another one. Excel users, uh, el sorry, Excel allows a user to adjust the number of iterative calculations to handle circular references. How can circular references be managed in Anaplan? And maybe that's a conversation. Yeah. yeah. Frankly, I didn't know Excel did that. <laughs> I've been using Excel a while. Yeah, yeah you can like decide when it maxes out in Excel. Um, in Anaplan, circular references are like by definition not allowed. Um, you can never write a formula that has a circular reference. We're able to handle it in a few ways. One of them is just by doing an import. Like if you wanted to iterate on something, you could either use Optimizer or you could import into a line item that allows you to then write a subsequent formula. Um, to solve for the same use case. We've done that a few times here internally, uh, but for the most part, as many of you probably know, you can't write a formula that breaks the platform or breaks the, the calculation engine. And so for the most part, we, we don't really allow for circular references. Well, and perhaps to our previous conversation, that's where you have the opportunity to reimagine what the outcome needs to be. That's exactly right. Yeah. With the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right. if you, once you have that architecture in mind of what you're trying to do and you have that Anaplan experience, you can start to mold the solution to how you can solve it in Anaplan rather than Excel. Yeah, it's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, some more questions coming in, you guys. Mm -hmm. It's important to have local and global <coughs> lists. So if I have many models, I don't need to copy the same list across all models. Do you have any plans for this? Mm -hmm. Or is that a workaround that we currently provide in the platform? Yeah, so I think that when it comes to product enhancements that come in the future, um, the product team is best to answer all of that, so I won't go into too much detail, <laughs> but we have discussed it. Um, global list would be very beneficial, especially for a large set of use cases, including um, having a data hub. So how we manage it without that product feature yet um, is we have our global lists that are governed through the data hub, and all of these guys know about our AOA lists um, that we use that are like our regional hierarchy, our cost center hierarchy, et cetera. Um, on top of that, each of our models have their own particular list that they may need to do some solution building. And so with that, we just use a naming convention to identify if it's an SPM, it has an SPM identifier before it, that then you know it's a local list coming from that model. PBF has the same thing. And so we're using those lists um, in consort with the idea of a global list that gets imported from the data hub. Again, as product moves forward, we'll see those changes, hopefully. Fantastic. And yeah. stay tuned on the community website for those updates to come. Raise those questions in the appropriate threads and we'll make sure it gets addressed with the product teams. So the next question. Uh, how would one handle a ragged people hierarchy using a numbered list? Already applied recursive hierarchy. Issues arise such as levels, employees moving up and down when the parent slash manager transfers is terminated, etc. What would be the best unique identifier as the code? So let me try and interpret that question. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds like in, in resource planning, when you have that hierarchy of people, mm -hmm. there's obviously factors that will adjust that. And I'm interpreting here. So if you submitted the question and I'm doing it incorrectly, mm -hmm. get back in there <laughs> uh, and correct me, please. I've got the live feed here. Um, but it sounds like there are external factors that change our hierarchy within that model. What's the best way to identify when those changes are made or get propagated in the model? How do you manage that? I think, I'm not sure I understood the question, to be honest, but I didn't either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what we do find, find sense in the, you know, territory and quota model when we, uh, the hierarchy keep changing, because the account hierarchy keep changing, right? So we load everything as, as a flat file in the model, and then from there we have internal processes within the model that will change the hierarchies. Got it. 
got it. So you load it as is how you know it, and then as you need to, you add an internal process that yeah. adjusts. I think a key part of that and what you built um, was you created a unique identifier by concatenating what mm -hmm. the processes create, right? Like so you have your account ID and also like the pod identifier, which then creates the hierarchy. So with an employee hierarchy, maybe you'd want to do the same thing, like the employee ID along with whatever change in the hierarchy might come creates a new code that produces the hierarchy. And that's exactly what Tubo built in SPM. Or if an employee is moving across the organization, what we do is we term them. Mm -hmm. So they might be moving from one call center to another. Um, what we do is we term them in that call center and then we kind of create them in the new. So they're not really moving, they're not moving in the hierarchy, they're just kind of going from point A to point B. A new code is created, yeah. yeah. Okay, and this is fantastic. And maybe um, what would be helpful before I even continue is, Byron, can you just give our audience a quick overview on how Anaplan is actually using Anaplan and what this team here is supporting on internal usage? Yeah, uh, that's great. Um, so we use it for basically everything when it comes to <laughs> our internal management. Um, so we have an ERP and a CRM, uh, Salesforce Workday, where we're bringing in source data when it comes to like our roster loads, our um, opportunity and account objects. We, we have a bunch of other source systems like Splunk and SurveyMonkey and uh, a few others, and we're bringing all that into an enterprise data warehouse, and then the entire planning function and like planning system of record happens within Anaplan. So we're really using it across the entire organization, from sales operations, finance operations, marketing operations, uh, accounting has a ton of use cases, uh, and then we have CS ops and HR who are using it heavily, our academy system, a community, they all have Anaplan models that do all of their planning procedures. So, I mean, I could talk forever about that. Um, I, you know, we should probably let Stephanie talk about how finance uses it and how Tubo talks about how sales, sales ops does. But uh, the short answer is that for anything that we think we can use Anaplan, we do use Anaplan internally. We are very much into drinking our own champagne. Part of Aaron and I's job um, on the AOA team is to make sure that we can design in Anaplan as many places as we possibly can and use it to really run our business. And so where a lot of companies use Excel or PowerPoint or other um, enterprise solutions to do any part of their planning or to have a system of record, we have done everything we can to make sure that Anaplan is that for us. And so really across, and there's a great diagram we have. Um, that shows, I think Pierre probably showed it earlier today, that we really use it. We have something like 60 internal models that cover about 100 of our standard use cases um, across all of our planning operations. So that's the, the short answer to what we actually do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and continuing. Um, so my question came in. It's a little bit more technical, but I'll throw it out there and you guys can interpret it. Any improvements on controlling data sparsity besides number list solutions? So I think that the question is around controlling data sparsity in other ways besides a numbered list. Um, and it, it's a product question for sure, but we'd yeah. love to hear how you guys handle that. Yeah, um, good one. I think that that is the best I could do um, with you know architecture changes coming. That's certainly an engineering and product question uh, for us. What I do know is that internally we've been communicating that as well. There are a lot of tips and tricks that we could pass over to you all about how to manage sparsity in a smarter way whether it's coming up with you know, automating subsets or having you know, well-architected lists and you know, parent-child relationships and uh, uh, settings to each line item uh, to the applies to that maximize the amount of space you're using. We've done that a lot in PDF to just try to you know, squeeze the most out of the lemon, so to speak. Um, but for the most part, um, scalability and sparsity within the platform is something that um, our engineering team is really focused on. Uh, and they'll be much better at speaking about it than I will as far as the future. But there's tricks that we have. Some of them are in the, uh, in the, the playbook, playbook yeah. um, that you guys all have the link to now uh, that will answer that for sure. Mm -hmm. And actually, just on the topic of numbered lists, uh, what is the most efficient way of sorting a numbered list by the display name? Speaking of tips and tricks. Sorting by, by the display name, I think if you uh, create a module with new uh, number list and you uh, create a line item with your display name, you can just use the sort button and, uh, and it will sort your list. Sure. Yeah. And again, we do have the Connected Planning Playbook mm -hmm. that Aaron reviewed, so check in there, use the community forums. Um, go Moving on. How do you use Anaplan to conduct surveys, i.e. ranking of projects, by multiple users? 
there a way to do that? Absolutely. Yeah, one more time. How, how do you use Anaplan to conduct a survey or a ranking of projects from multiple users? So you guys, you, uh, Sam does this internally, right, with the finance projects he has coming? Yes, but um, I don't know if each user can rank the projects. Yeah, I think he's just ranking them. Yeah, yeah, it might be that like you could have, if you had a lot of users within a model, you could come up with a way for each of them, just using like a yeah. Boolean, uh, to like place a vote on what are the priorities, or even just entering in a number into a cell as to what the priorities are, and you could aggregate that. Got we it. do surveys all the time. We had a sales survey that went out about a year ago how to manage um, some of our models internally. Um, so building surveys is relatively easy. You just have like use the user list, um, and then just depending on how you want to like Boolean format line items or number of format line items, you can produce a result, aggregate it very easily, um, and then do that. It's basic and simple and plan actually um, to do that type of stuff. It's just depending on the use case, I guess. Got it. Hopefully that helps. Again, leverage the community forums. We have experts on staff. We'll always go back in and double check and make sure. Um, we actually have a very eager viewer who said, I couldn't limit myself to one thing, so I have a technical question and one UX question. So here's a technical one. The ability to suppress zeros besides numbered lists. Is there an ability to suppress zeros besides a numbered list? I'm reading that directly, so. You can filter them out. Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I don't know what the yeah. exact use case is. Mm -hmm. You can filter them out, you can also format them uh, so that they don't look like zeros. Um, but if I, I don't exactly know what the uh, goal or the result is. Any more information. Yeah, so as a follow-up, please submit that question into one of the forum threads or re-enter into the um, AMA question list. You're going to have to use a new name to get back in because I think you can only submit one question at a time. Mm -hmm. Nope. I've heard confirmation. I am absolutely <laughs> wrong on that one. <laughs> submit as many questions as you want. So get in there and feel free to clarify. Um, now, the UX question. Are there more conditional formatting options? So we've seen internally, obviously, the way that conditional formatting set up, it seems a little bit limiting at first, but if you're willing to put in some effort and kind of have some workarounds, we have some really impressive models. I think our partner central is one of them um, that we could that we could share some ideas. Um, but it, it's a little bit more manual. There's definitely some additional steps if you want to make it a little bit fancier. Again, the beauty of the platform, you can get it to do what you need it to do. Right. <laughs> Imagine it. Um, actually, here's, here's a question that's an interesting one. What's your favorite element of the Anaplan ecosystem? And, conversely, what's the one thing do you wish Anaplan could do, but currently does not? I think for me, having been in finance for the past seven years, my favorite part about it is just how real time and collaborative it is. So I can just think of so many examples where we'd spend weeks pulling together data, putting together decks, and going through the review process. And late in the game, you get feedback from an executive, and you kind of have to start back at square one. I think what's amazing about Anaplan is you can make those changes, and it's going to get reflected back in all of your dashboards, modules, etc. Um, in terms of, of one thing that I wish it could do. I'm still so new to it. Um, I think I think you have to come back to me on that one. Yeah, it just means you haven't found it yet. I haven't found it. It's already possible. What about you, Thibaut? Long time user? Um, yeah, I mean, what I really like about Anapan is it, it's easy at some points. I mean, you have a learning curve, of course, but when you get used to it, it's really easy and you can, the more you work on it, the more you realize how flexible it is and you can end up with things you will never think about first, because you can really do pretty much what you want on it. Uh, and what I don't like about Anaplan, uh, I don't uh, know yet. We didn't go that <laughs> far. <laughs> it's still a long time user, and yeah. there's still nothing. No, honestly, you can do a lot of things if That's you are creative enough. There's the challenge right there yeah. to everybody, creativity. Stephanie? Um, my favorite thing about Anaplan is just the ability to be connected. Um, right now I'm building like a long-term model and I'm having it speak to our PBF model. So I love that I can connect those two and have them speak to each other and I can even have them kind of loop like that 
long-term model can speak to PBF and then PBF can speak back to the long-term model. I think that's super cool. Um, what I wish I, we could have on Anaplan is kind of like a wizard that tells you like, hey, this model or this formula is wrong. Maybe you should do this other formula. That would work. Yeah. Um, that's what well, would be super helpful. <laughs> stay tuned for that. Yeah. Wink, wink. <laughs> Uh, I have like two pretty detailed answers. Uh, my favorite part about Anaplan is the idea that any member within a list can change within its hierarchy. So if you wanted to move, like in a regional hierarchy, if you wanted to move the San Francisco office to a MIA for whatever reason, uh, you could do that. It's really easy just to change a parent within a hierarchy and everywhere throughout the entire model you get updated. Uh, similar to Aaron, I worked in FP&A for years. Uh, and every time that there was an organizational change, our entire finance team would just be completely shut down because we had new Excel models to build, uh, new things to develop. We'd have to like send out entire new hierarchies to everything and make sure that they all worked. In Anaplan, I can change like sometimes one cell, and then all the changes are made throughout the entire model. With us and our data hub, we can do it at a central place, and then it prof proliferates out, which makes it even better um, across the entire company, which is just truly amazing. It's something that, as soon as I saw that happen in Anaplan, I'm like, sold, I'll <laughs> use it forever. Um, and then uh, another geeky answer on um, what I want to see change, uh, similar to what the question was, is global lists. Um, having a global list that could come, and you only need to create it once within a certain customer, within a workspace, that would save an immense amount of time um, so that you don't need to like resubscribe and create a second list within each model. If you could have something that went um, completely uh, across an entire customer, then that would be, that would be ideal. So. I wonder if you just volunteered <laughs> yourself for something. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> Very possible. Um, we're just going to take a quick little break here, uh, have a chance to regroup, get some more of the questions in, keep them coming guys, we'll tackle them over the next 25 minutes and we'll see you in a few. Welcome back guys, I hope you enjoyed that quick commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, CPX coming up, coupon sponsored. code, <laughs> yes, sponsored by <laughs> Anaplan CPX, <laughs> use your 50% off discount code. <laughs> with community CPX50, anaplan.com slash CPX. Okay, so I, I did notice that we've got some more questions coming in and a couple of them are pretty technical. Um, so I'm gonna try and rephrase a couple of them and see if we can get to that. Um, so when you look at model building, um, do you think about a way to stamp the current user, stamp the current user one a line item. So if this is a scenario, the user creates a numbered list and in the model they would like to stamp the user who created this. Is there a way that you guys build models to track that? I've never tried that before myself. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you could have a user input in that same, you know, mm -hmm. when you create a new item, like how we do create recs within PBF, you could have, you could force them to fill out that line item to say like who was it that filled this out just so you could record it. Um, the other way you could maybe come up with a way to use the audit history to do that, um, uh, where you could export that and then um, and then put it back in just see like what cells were updated by who. Um, so it depends on, on what you would want to do, but I've never personally tried that. That's a good yeah. idea. No. Oh. If you, no, maybe if you want only a certain user to be able to create this, you can use selective access. That would be maybe yeah. a solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but to uh, automatically the name populated, uh, maybe a process which is uh, based on history. Yeah, maybe. You know, this, this leads me to some additional questions that weren't necessarily submitted, but I'm going to take the liberty to ask because I can. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know, and this is a general question, I use the Anaplan model that was built for, for marketing every day. I work out of it. This is It's basically what dictates our activity, tracks and reports our activities, and we roll it up into overall sales and finance reporting. When you guys think about model building in Anaplan, how long does it take? How many stakeholders need to be consulted? And you know, is there a best practice that you've developed in your jobs that our viewers should know about? When it comes to building Anaplan models? You got it. I mean, the building itself is fairly quick. Uh, it's more about coming to an agreement with all the stakeholders, so it's really always the governance 
who should be involved, who has the stakeholders, etc. So you do all these um, important meetings, and once you uh, you can follow the end up and wait for instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's what we yeah. yeah. I yep. guess. <laughs> and there's a lot of details on that in the yeah. playbook. So, so everybody uh, put his um, user story, so everybody you know say what he needs, and then you come up with. Uh, an agreement on which uh, which one has the priorities, and we can you know, go uh, grow from there. Yeah. I would yeah. agree. You have to definitely agree as a team. Share you know what has been your issues in the past, how you want to make it better, and you have to be aligned as a group as to what you want your model to really do and what you want the outcome to be. Um, until that happens, the building won't be successful, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the more you can get the business engaged with the build and understanding exactly what they want, um, the more seamless it'll be, definitely. Yeah, and as far as quantity goes, I think it, it purely depends on what you're trying to build out. Right? If you have a very simple model that has only a handful of subject matter experts and stakeholders, bring them in. You want to make sure that they're included. There's other cases where you could have 20 or so people, a lot, you know, many organizations that are all involved, in which case you have to do the same thing. So quantity really depends on what you're trying to solve. Um, but for the most part, it's just a great idea to get scoping done ahead of time. And as Thibaut just said, the building is actually the easy part at the end once you uh, actually get everything together. On the and something I've noticed is because we have such a rich ecosystem here, we have so many models already built. Sometimes I think I'm starting from scratch when I want to build something, but you may notice that somebody's already done a lot of that work for you. Right. Um, so sometimes something, like the more work you do in Anaplan, the more you're setting yourself up for success later, which I think is great. That's awesome. And so the three takeaways that I got from that are, number one, the Anna plan way. There is actually a business process that you can follow to make sure that your models are successful and you're addressing what the business needs. Yep. Number two, the connected planning playbook ties in with the Anna plan way to provide a little bit more instruction. So you can watch a replay of Aaron's session or access it online. Remember, you guys are the first to see this. Nobody else has seen it yet, so take advantage of that. And then the third one, of course, was just what Byron mentioned right now. So let's make sure that you know you maintain your um, your models and keep up with that. So yeah. leads me to some some other questions, guys. Model maintenance. What does that look like in Anaplan when? What was that stat that you said for our internal usage, Byron? Uh, Sixty models with a hundred <coughs> use cases. And how many users now? Uh, we have, I think, about 800 and 900 users internally, so it's almost the whole company. Maintenance. How? What? What do you think about? Yeah, so good question. Um, the, the best part about Anaplan is we manage pretty much all of those models with a team of about 15 or 20 of us on the Anaplaner Council. So that just shows you the scale of what you can achieve with a, with a small group and the, the scale of the platform. It's really impressive. Uh, when it comes to maintenance, uh, Good part about it is that if things don't change, um, Anaplan works by itself. It, it does not break, um, which is amazing. Um, on the other hand, uh, things do change a lot in, re in reality. And so there are always metrics that um, change or need to be updated or you get new um, you know, strategy insights coming down from the top level. And so you have to build new models. Um, so how we maintain that and the best way to do it really uh, is to have like strong running rules and governance around how you build, who you talk to, using the Anaplan way when you're doing completely new builds. When you're having changes done, make sure that there's internal buy-off. We have a lot of meetings that just goes into um, changes that are coming, whether it's to the hierarchies or to how we produce a metric, uh, that are really important. And so when it comes to formula writing, there are times where I mean, all of us go in and just make slight changes, um, and then you have buy-ins and check-offs on how that actually works. But from a large scale, we go through the motions, right? We spend time on the Anaplan way. We govern ourselves. We spend a lot of time just sitting and making sure that everyone's on the same page, collaborating, communicating, as we talked about before. Um, yeah, so maintenance, you don't, you shouldn't have to you know, be constantly going under the hood unless something changes, really, yeah. is the answer. And uh, the connected planning, right? All the models are connected to a central model hub yeah. from which it's pushed the data. So if you want to make a change in the hierarchy, you change it in the source module, and then it goes everywhere. Mm. Uh, the beauty of Anaplan. <laughs> um, and if I'm a viewer and I'm a user in the community, um, you know, one of the things that often comes up is there's not necessarily pushback on leveraging Anaplan in the business, but how do you get people to really feel as passionate as I do or as you do about using the platform and the value of it? Yeah, so I remember in my previous roles, we would have different software companies come in and sell to us. 
And as the finance org, we were super resistant. We wanted to use Excel, <laughs> or we'd use their tool as like the very last step of whatever we were doing and import it to the tool. And um, I think what it ultimately came down to was that we weren't using the tool, not because we were stubborn and trying to be difficult, but because there were things that the tool couldn't do. Um, the tool just wasn't flexible enough. And so I think with Anaplan, um, as a center of excellence or as an experienced model builder within your companies, I think you really need to be able to help your business partners understand that there aren't really that many things that Anaplan can't do. Um, and I think that will really help in terms of getting buy-in. If it's really a collaborative tool, right? So if you change the data within a cell in the model, it will affect all the other model potentially. So you don't really have a choice. If once you do, once we go with the connected planning, you it's it's really easy to collaborate with it. So you have no reason going outside. If you go outside of an app plan, then you put yourself in a corner. It's difficult, you know, to, to collaborate with uh, other people. So I would recommend just staying in a plan where there is a single s uh, source of truth and just yeah, it right. becomes more simple and consolidated when you do yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. I would add to that by saying a lot of times we just lead by example. Using in a plan, uh, you can find the power of the platform just by investing your time in it. I think that the fp team is a really good example of that. Once you start, you get a taste for mm -hmm. it. Um, you notice that it, everything is better, faster, um, consolidated in a way that, that really makes it powerful. So by just building out those solutions, getting yourself going, um, other people will want to buy into that power. Yeah. Um, just to also add, um, it's true for, uh, for our team, once we built our PBF model, um, I think we realized how much how much our lives became easier, um, how many less hours we're spending on rolling up a forecast, and now we're thinking, what's next? So one of the projects I'm doing is now we're pulling our headcount projections and um, also pulling our recruiting data from Greenhouse, and we're layer we're building a dashboard that you can see both, so it enables recruiting and finance to plan accordingly. Um, so that's just an example of us now seeing the potential of the platform and how much efficiency it can bring in a lot of aspects of our job. You know, that's a really good point, Stephanie, because I think you're now providing two different groups that mm -hmm. didn't necessarily understand how they would get an additional mm -hmm. insight, mm -hmm. and you're delivering it to them. So it's giving them what they didn't actually know that they needed to yeah. know. Exactly. Which, you know, it, that's how I got hooked on it, too. <laughs> um, there is a question in here that just came in that I think is is interesting to get your feedback as a team, but what are some of the best ways you have found to indicate the data displayed on dashboards is still moving and not finalized yet? Are there any suggested methods other than creating a module that acts as a tracker and then publishing that to the top of each dashboard? And while they think about that, the question got cut off so I summarized it a little bit for you. <laughs> so uh, the bottom half of that, the the example you gave, we do do that exact same thing. Um, we do sometimes have data that moves. You want it to be live uh, in many cases. And so there are a couple ways to solve it. One is to have that module that does track changes. We do that PDF and SPM, um, for example. Uh, it's a good way to keep us straight and making sure that um, when we lock a forecast or something, we want to make sure that it, it stays in the same place, especially when we make changes to the architecture. So we do do that. There are other ways you can handle it in our bookings model. We actually have an approval boolean that the accounting management puts in to make sure that once we have finalized numbers that management has to go in and approve it and that then begins a process to make it so that the data is even available to others. And so you can do some tricks around like approval access and booleans to even make things available. Um, and on top of that, uh, I'd just like to say that like a lot of the data management um, comes to like knowing how in a plan can be constructed and then like best implementing that for like what the particular use case is. Um, so it's, it's really up to the end user and what the use case is. Yeah, in, in sales operation we use snapshots a lot, so we really track week over week what changes, mm -hmm. so if you track your, your pipeline for instance and want to right. see uh, if it got converted or not, uh, we, we snapshot all the opportunity, we snapshot all the account to see the account movement from a rep to another, etc. So uh, we use snapshots a lot. Yeah. Because the beauty of it is that the data is always in motion, it's being updated. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a great question. Thank you for those responses. Um, thinking about what you guys do here, and by the way, I'm baffled by their mo the way their minds work because I can't even wrap my head around it. Mm -hmm. I remember there was 
when was it, a couple weeks ago, I came to Byron with a, we have a challenge with our merchandise planning. And he had rattled off the simple solution to it that was just way over my head. And to me, that was a moment of clarity. For you guys, what is, what was your moment of clarity when you realized Anaplan is a platform that's going to drive my career? A little personal reflection here. I think for me, it's just like we do everything in PBF. It has a lot of use cases. Um, we do fixed assets and depreciation. We do balance sheet and cash flow. Just the fact that everything is in one place and when we're when someone is updating, let's say, like a forecast for one cost center and you're just adding 10,000 in consulting, that's flowing everywhere. And to me, that was just a wow because I've never seen that happen just in one place. I usually just contribute one little thing and I don't really see what the impact is. Um, but that to me is super powerful and um, amazing. It's great. I can go. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. For me, it's the uh, other way around. I, I started my analyst career at Anaplan. And so every time I go, I need to go to Excel to do a quick fix. I do use Excel sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I we all do. Or do they do that in other companies? For well, uh, TNQ, for instance, the way we assign accounts is very simple. Just take a few clicks and you're done. Uh, it calculates your uh, total addressable market, uh, your uh, open mm -hmm. pipeline, everything. And I think, I, I don't, honestly, I don't know what they do in, in other companies. I would, I would hate my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is why we exist, and that's why you're here, Thibaut. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks for your patience and for sticking around. We did not go anywhere. Minor technical difficulties. Not a contingency that we planned for. Was not in the model at all. <laughs> um, but Aaron, maybe I can ask you one more time just to round up your aha moment if there was one. Yeah, I think for me, it was just when I, I was kind of getting the demo during my interview process, actually, and being in finance for, for a while, I just kind of thought, you know, where has the Anaplan been all my life? Uh, <laughs> so it happened really early for me. That's why I'm here. So great to have you here. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> oh, for me, it was when I was working on PBF, and we built a model that does a lot of use cases, fixed assets, modeling, um, balance sheet cash flow and being able to update one thing and it flowing through all the other modules, I think that was a super powerful moment for me. Yeah, I'll say that um, I saw it first when I first saw a pre-sales demo as well, um, and I saw what it could do, how fast it could do it, um, and the number of companies that are using Anaplan across the entire world just opened up uh, the idea that uh, this is a next generation platform it's going to be driving businesses for a long time. If I have that skill set, I can work at any of those Fortune 2000 companies that exist across the world. So it was pretty exciting. True. Very true. You know, I think what I've heard from everybody is that it's actually the power of the platform. When you start to see the data come together, and as Tivo pointed out, when you compare it to the traditional or manual ways that it's been done, you wonder why. Uh, guys, it's been so great to have you all here. Uh, thank you for the conversation, and I will not escort you, but I guess, I mean, you guys are, are free to go and enjoy the, the wonderful meal that's waiting for you while we close up here. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.